This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. We are speaking with Daniel Schumann, who is the Policy Director for Demand Progress and is an expert on the machinations of our federal government when it comes to releasing data. Welcome, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to see you, Carl. Good to see you. I wanted to talk about bulk data and the federal government. That's an area you've been involved with for a little while, right? Oh, only a bit, only a minute or two. <laughs> I'd say a um, dozen years at this point. Not as long as you, but a little bit. Is the government doing a pretty good job of making bulk data available? By bulk data, I mean edicts of government, things that come from the Congress and the government printing office and places like that. So it's spotty, um, as, as you know. Uh, some places are better than others. Uh, inside the legislative branch, which is where I spend most, most of my time, I think we've seen tremendous improvements. Uh, we have all bills uh, uh, available online as structured data, including what happens to them, and they're slowly going backward in time. They've recently made all laws publicly available, and they're in the process of making those available in structured data formats. They're putting all the committee reports available online. They're increasingly publishing vote information as structured data. Uh, the Senate isn't quite, quite as good as the House. Uh, the GPO has a bulk data repository, which is actually pretty well managed. Um, and there is a, a public-private partnership, uh, the um, bulk data task force, uh, where you see active collaboration. So pledge branch is good. When you say structured data, what do you mean? What are they doing to structure the data? As a general rule, they're publishing it. At, uh, they've created a... a a legislative markup standard, actually two of them, um, uh, USLM, the United States Legislative Markup, um, which uh, is a form of XML, and they're publishing most of their information uh, in those formats uh, so that you can, uh, not me, because I'm not, I'm not particularly technical, but, but you, I imagine, could, could go through and pull down all the information. Uh, it tells you what's in there. It's well-formed, and you can play with it to your heart's delight. Uh, and they make it available both in bulk and they also, GPO has a, um, a number of APIs that are available for public use as well. Uh, so you can either get a little bit at a time or you can get it all at once, whatever makes your heart happy. For example, the laws, are, are they simply being marked up going forward or have they gone back in time? Do we have the first Congress? Or We don't have the first Congress in structured data. Um, it, it, we ran a project maybe seven years ago to make all the all the laws enacted by Congress available online. And uh, we built metadata that went with that so that you can look up by three different citation methods, any law, and it will bring up the relevant PDF. So that's not great, but it means that if you want to see uh, the first bill ever enacted by Congress, you can do so. Um, they have now undertaken a similar initiative, uh, and we gave them our data, uh, where you can go and you can, in theory, look up every law from beginning, from, well, actually from the Continental Congress, but from certainly from the from 1789 to present. And you can you can get at first they are publishing these like giant volumes, which is not particularly helpful if you want to find the individual thing. And now they're making it so you can actually do pinpoint citations, so you can find the thing itself. This is a statute at large, right? Right. That's right. Um, they're all, they've also, for a while now, they've had um, the text of all bills in Congress going back to 1994, 1995, have been published online as HTML, but they weren't publishing the, the publishing it in aggregate. So a number of organizations like Josh Chabra at GovTrack had been sort of pulling down all of the bill text and then reassembling and publishing it back online. But starting in 2012, they went and they've begun publishing all that information as structured data. So they will tell you all the bills uh, going back to 1995. Uh, they'll tell you what's happened to them, which is their action information. They also have taken CRS as summaries of the legislation, and they're publishing that as structured data as well. And they are going back in time. So they have this really cool project to show you how an amendment would change a bill or a bill would change a law in real time. Uh, it's something that's currently deployed in the House uh, to about a couple hundred offices. And to make that work, you have to go and digitize all the laws. So they, they, they are going through and they are digitizing um, uh, every law. Uh, uh, you know, so there's statutory, there, there's um, positive and non-positive law, 
some some the U.S. code is only partially the law. Uh, half the U.S. code is not the actual law. Uh, so for the things that that have been enacted, they've gone back and are transforming that into a structured data format. So they can basically run this process on top of it. So if, if you have this bill that says we're going to amend this other law and that other law amended this other law and, you know, it's um, turtles all the way down, they basically are running a process that rolls that all the way back up and it will show you uh, the different sort of versions of the of the law as it existed at that point in time so that you can then say, well, how would this amendment change it, or how would this bill change it? And that is largely working at this point. It's been a half decade long project. Um, it's not available to the public yet. I'm hoping that it will be. Um, but right but but right now it's currently rolled out to a couple hundred offices in the house. When you say positive law, what you're saying is that the statutes at large are the actual laws that are passed. They then get codified into the U.S. code and the Congress will take a title of the U.S. code and stamp it and say, this is definitive. So you don't need to go back to the statutes at large. That's right. And only I think half of the titles uh, are, are positive law. So the other half uh, obviously are not. And, and in those cases, they will also do um, um, they will do I uh, see like the versioning for the U.S. code, even though it's not official, because that's the way that most people can actually understand what's going on. You said you gave them some data. Who in the government? Who, who did you give this to? Uh, the Law Library of Congress. So so at, well, what we actually did uh, is we put all of the information available online with no with no claim of copyright. And we pointed them to it and said, you can use this if you wish. Um, and that's and that's generally what we do is we we will try to make the information available online for free with no copyright attached to it so that if other folks want to either reuse the data or if there's code that's a company, if they want to reuse the code, uh, they're able to do so. Were they worried that the data that you had put online might have inaccuracies in it? Did, did they audit your stuff? Do you have any idea? You know, we share with them what we had done. We showed what we had built, whether they used it in terms of creating their own system or not. I don't know. Um, we have found other instances where what we've done has inspired them to do things, um, but we don't know to what extent that they they took what we did and, and sort of brought it in for what they're doing. You mentioned a bulk data task force, which has public and private participation. Can you tell me about that? We had a, um, a big effort in 2009, 2010, 2011 to try to make um, the information that was published by the Library of Congress to be published in bulk. And the Library of Congress refused to do so and have been refusing for the last 20 years before that. Um, and we had gotten to a point where a member was going to offer an amendment on the floor to the appropriations bill to accomplish this purpose. And the library, in their infinite wisdom, decided to create a committee to kill it. So they pushed Congress to create a committee, which was the Bulk Data Task Force. And the Bulk Data Task Force consisted of representatives from the different silos inside the legislative branch. So uh, the deputy clerk of the House, a guy named Bob Reeves, was responsible for it. And I had representatives from the clerk's office, um, from leadership in the House, from Democrats and Republicans, from the relevant committees of jurisdiction, uh, from the Senate side as well, from the Senate sergeant at arms and other folks. And these people got together um, to examine this issue. And they largely, some of them had worked together. Most of them didn't even know each other. And they realized that they had an affinity, that they were all in the same business, doing the same kind of thing, were technical people, um, and they created a, a hearing process. So we came in and we testified before them. It was me, uh, Tom Bruce, who was then at Cornell, Josh Tauberer at GovTrack, uh, a couple other folks I can't remember. Um, and we spoke with them about what we were trying to do. And to our astonishment, they decided that what we had suggested was reasonable. And they recommended that this information, uh, the legislative information should be published online in bulk. Um, and then they realized that these meetings were really productive and that they wanted to continue them. So they continued the meetings, having uh, quarterly meetings with all the stakeholders, the stakeholders both inside the legislative branch and those on the outside, as well as having their own set of internal meetings. And while the work was focused on bulk access to legislative data, it's gone broader than that. So the, the scope is actually getting wider and wider. And what, you know, we aim to change a technology, but what we did was we changed a culture. 
uh, they now have they they publish more of their code online. They have their their information is available on GitHub. You can submit, you can ask them for things, and they will meet your request. Uh, there's opportunities for regular conversation. It's a collaboration. Uh, there have been annual transparency conferences that they've hosted every year, with the exception of last year because of COVID. They had a couple of hackathons. Uh, it's created this environment where it becomes possible for all the people who care about this stuff to talk with each other and to build better and sort of more interesting things. Um, so that's what the bulk data task force is. Um, at this point, the select command the modernization of Congress is recommending to change its name because its scope is much larger than, than what its name suggests. And there've been recommendations to give it more staffing and to give it more support. Um, but it seems to have created an environment where in most of the little silos across the legislative branch, all the key players are coming together and having regular conversations about how to meet their internal needs, as well as meeting the needs of outside stakeholders like us and the press and paid services and folks like that. And it's it's been the sort of biggest surprise of my career um, and a really welcome one. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited to keep working with them. It's so much fun. I see. In many state and municipal environments, the process of codification and promulgation has been outsourced to vendors. There is some direction by the government in the form of a code commission or a secretary of state, but the work is largely done by the vendor. In fact, in many cases, the vendor has the exclusive right to sell these edicts. This work you're talking about in the federal government, this is pretty much done in-house, right? That's exactly right. So there's uh, there's an office inside the House, uh, the Office of Law Revision Council, and their job is to take the um, provisions of law, the the you know the the you know the, the different slip laws basically, and to take them and to mash them up into how they would go into the U.S. code to provide suggested legislation uh, back to the Congress. The Congress considers that legislation, at least in theory, and then will pass the recommendation codifications and, and enact those into law. These folks have been one of the drivers behind the, the comparative print project that I was talking about, where you can show on amendment changes to bill. Because when you're drafting the stuff, being able to automate a lot of that's very helpful. And they, they're working in concert with Ledge Council, which are the folks who draft the 20,000 bills that are introduced each year, because they also have this great need to be able to take an idea that's given to them by a congressional office and to turn it into legislative text and then be able to see how sort of the legislative text would intersect with, with the law or with an underlying bill. Um, so it's a, it's a totally public process. They publish all their information online as structured data on their website. Uh, it's routinely updated um, and it's used by all manner of folks uh, in civil society and elsewhere to make sure that they have an updated version of, of what the law is at any given time. How big an operation is that? Do you have any idea? I think it's about 40 people. Okay. Um, they're, they're, having, they're having a little bit of problems recently. Um, they're not able to pay their attorneys enough. Uh, which is creating some retention problems. So it takes like four or five years before you get really good at it. Um, so they're ha so they've been having a little bit of of retention problems, but the House and the Senate seem to be working that out in terms of like addressing the the pay issue. Um, but they're incredibly open, and um, they realize the value of technological modernization to make their lives easier. So they're one of the driving forces behind it. They do the codification. And then the government publishing office does the promulgation. They stand up the GovInfo system and make the stuff available and do the APIs. Then there's a third piece of the puzzle. It's the Office of the Federal Register that does the codification. They do the Federal Register, obviously, the official newspaper of government. But they also do the codification of regulations. My understanding is that's a similar size operation. It sounds like there's... 150 people involved in making the laws of our federal government available? I would I would have to talk to GPO. I don't know how large their team is that's working on, on that side. 40. Uh, 
I, oh, so you, obviously you would know better than I do. Um, I think there's some technological uh, economies of scale that will probably be realized as they as they update the format in which this is published to makes it easier. Uh, GPO, as as you know better than I do, they, they were previously using microcomp, which they were using a uh, a format that like it's like using a PDF, right? Like it looks right, but there's no data. Right or it's very difficult, and they and they're move, and everyone is sort of moving together over to this USLM system, so it becomes easier to move the information from sort of one stage of the process to another. Uh, and the only thing that I would amend to your to what you said before was that um, the the Office of Law Revision Council, like they also publish it, so their stuff goes online virtually instantaneously, and then there's a process by which it goes to GP. You know, you know, it has to get enacted and if it gets enacted then it goes to gpo so you you do have the unofficial code available uh very rapidly vendors be they lexus west fast case whatever they just go in on a regular basis they download the stuff and they ingest it in their systems yeah and, and in fact one of the values of the bulk data task force is that um there have been concerns from one of the vendors in terms of the frequency in which this information was updated so gpo and uh changed one how they signal that the information had been updated and changed the frequency so that it best matched the needs of some of the vendors so they were getting it um right in the time that they needed because it, it you know it didn't matter to gpo when they did it in a particular time of day so this was a way that they could be responsive to the community and it was just one of the you know you sit in the meeting and like they have this 30 second conversation resolves a significant problem for one of the folks in terms of getting information out. It was really nice to see. I guess the one missing piece of this puzzle is the uh, judicial branch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the, the missing in, in, in more than one sense. I agree. <laughs> the Open Courts Act has promised to change that situation. I've been delighted to see the GSA has been tagged with helping turn that into something real. Supreme Court does a pretty good job, though, don't you think? Uh, in terms of publishing their opinions? Getting stuff available. They, they've got the dockets. It's free. It's not an API and it's not XML, but... They, they've come a long way, right? Uh, I think 10 years ago, we made a mock-up of what their website should look like. Uh, maybe more than that now. And uh, maybe five or six years ago, they started actually implementing some of our suggestions. Um, I mean, there are things that they're obviously missing. Um uh, you know, uh, uh, an off, uh, their communications office could be more responsive. Uh, we would personally like to see like their financial disclosure form is being available online. And there's a lot of like other stuff being able to watch their, watch their, um, proceedings instead of listening to them would be nice. Uh, but in terms of access to the law, yeah, it's much better between what they're publishing and what's available historically. You can, you can look up a fair amount of stuff. I think I I think that they're not publishing the file the indigent filings. I'd have to go back and look at it. So like if you're a paid litigant, then then the the docket information is available. It's a little confusing, but not too bad. But but for folks who are engaged in like you know if you're a prisoner or something like that, like I last time I checked and it could be a different story now. But the last time I checked, um, that information was not available online. That's a policy decision, though. It's like saying you shall not put Social Security numbers in your briefs. It's like not making family law cases available in state courts. I have no objection to that. Do the vendors like Lexus and West have the indigent filings? Do you know? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there, there have been news reporting that the court. The, so the, the clerks in the court were treating um the filing by 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 folks who were doing it in form of papyrus like the the like they were that they were not treating them with the same level of uh rigor that they were treating other filings so it was basically there were there were allegations that was creating sort of a class system where some some folks get treated better than other folks and i i don't know the merits of that or whether that's changed um but having attention drawn Having all folks who ask for the court to hear their claims to be treated equally does seem like a reasonable thing to do. One of the things that happened when President Obama took office, groups like the Sunlight Foundation were formed. There was a feeling that transparency of data was a good government thing. Some government people were like, we've got enough to do already. Why do we also have to do this? 
Do you sense a feeling inside of the government that the work they've done on bulk data in systems like GovInfo is helping them do their job better? That it's not just a burden? So, I mean, that's too broad a question for me to answer. I can only tell you the small parts that I have uh, interaction with. Um, Some places definitely understand that. So we've seen um, circularity of information. So, so. there was a circumstance, for example, where uh, the majority leader of the House wanted information about legislation. He couldn't get it from the Library of Congress because they weren't publishing it in the right format. So he would go, that office would go and get that information from GovTrack. And it created, uh, and there's a number of circuits, this still exists. So if you, if, if you want um, staffer information, uh, you know, who's working on what issue, um, you can't get that officially internally. You actually have to go and pay a private vendor to go and get access to your own data that your own chamber of, of Congress is creating. So there, there is this um, um, uh, getting information from the outside. So there are a number of folks as they try to solve the problems that they're trying to solve is they'll use outside information in like sort of our model of advocacy, which I think mirrors what, what you had done with Edgar, um, is that we get them to publish some information in whatever way they're willing to publish it we then show them what's possible. So we'll build a, a, you know, you will either build a wet, like we built every CRS report as a model for publishing CRS reports. We built a new website um, that shows you like the hidden bills that are inside legislation. So a bill will have other bills inside. So we actually identify the sources of the ideas in legislation. It's a way of sort of tracking legislative memes. And that in turn is inspiring them to go and build their internal systems. So we're seeing this sort of driving process where the people who want to solve these sort of technology, these these information asymmetries, these information problems, uh, will look to the outside um, for data and for for inspiration, and then we'll bring it sort of back inside. So for those people, absolutely, right? They get the value of bulk data, they get the value of structured data, they get the value of APIs, they understand the value of publishing this information because it's going to empower the ecosystem. But there are still a lot of folks who who sort of take Lord Acton's advice in, in, in the wrong way and they say, knowledge is my power, right? I don't want to share information because this is what empowers me to do things. So if you look at the Senate, right now, uh, so on, on the House side, you can see a bill before it's voted on on the floor. You can see all the amendments that are going to be considered. In the Senate, you cannot. That is not possible. They have an internal system. Uh, that publishes the first 150 pages of any bills that are currently under debate as a PDF. And they put it up 15 minutes within when the debate starts or the amendments, which means that the Senate will pass resolutions or bills before they're publicly available, and they won't even be fully available to all the members of the Senate. Um, And there are some folks in the Senate who realize that the system doesn't work well. And there are some folks who are very happy to have their legislation passed before people have an opportunity to know what's inside. Uh, So you do have these informational games. You also have these uh, bureaucrats. It's like bureaucratic inertia, but it's not even that. It's it's something it's it's like a cousin to that. It's it's this. We've always done it this way. We've been doing it this way since 1789, which is not always true. Right. Um, uh, or at least ever since I've been here, and that's how we're going to, or it's being done this way for a reason. And although I can't articulate the reason why it's being done this way, there must have been a good reason. So there's no reason to change it because that reason is still valid, even though I don't know what that reason was. And you get a lot of that too. Like, the, and, and that uh, that is troublesome. I think the executive branch is different. They They engage more of like this data empowers uh, services like there's you know it's, it's as as you know uh, probably better than I do you know the open government movement sort of fractured into a couple of pieces like there's one piece which is for government accountability there's another piece which is for service delivery there's more and more of that there's a real emphasis behind that so you see that with the U.S. Digital Service you see it with ATF uh, you see it like for example with efforts to apply for COVID relief funds for business being run out of the SBA so you see that type of thing to facilitate sending information in or getting information out. Uh, And for that, people understand that having your website crash when you're trying to figure out um, how to get Obamacare um, 
is probably not the world's greatest thing, both for service delivery and for politics. And that seems to drive uh, a fair amount of transformation. Uh, but it's, it's very uneven, as you might expect. Pushing the data out to the large users that are outside of government has been transformational. I talked to the folks at Cornell LII, and I, I said, look, the Supreme Court's up and running. Is your Supreme Court archive getting any traffic still? And they're like, yeah, because what we do, for example, is we cross-link every reference in there if we can find the case. And then we go find laws that reference that Supreme Court opinion, and we provide all this value added. For them, the more the government walks up the food chain, the better Cornell LII can do their job. I suspect that is similarly the case with Lexus and West, Fastcase and Justy and everyone else that consumes this kind of information. So the, the first step was getting this information to be published in any way humanly possible. And we've largely won most of that battle. There's still a lot that's hard to get and there's like some bad processes. But generally speaking, most people in the federal government are going to agree like certain data sets should be published online. Then the question is, so if you want to look at the telework data for the federal government, it's published as a 300 page PDF. I don't know why I've asked them not to do that. There's a OMB directive saying that you're not supposed to do it, but they persist in doing it anyway. So there is that, you know, they're sort of stuck in the old publishing model. So I, I think the, the second level, which is publishing it as data and the third piece, which is like what Cornell does, which is, and then infusing the data with connections to other information, like those two pieces are still very much a work in progress. Although I think we've largely won much of the battle in terms of you should be publishing this online in some fashion. That's been a 15 year process. It's not one yet, but the federal government does a pretty good job. Is it realistic that our states and municipalities could be performing at that level in the next de decade that we could? Because right now, that's definitely not the case in the states. Even with the municipalities, there's pretty good municipal ordinance sites out there that are they're all out there with vendors and it's not available in bulk. But is it realistic that the goal that in the next decade we could have all edicts of government of the United States available? Is that realistic? So you would be a better one to assess the whether it's realistic. I, could, I mean, I certainly think they should. Is it technically realistic that we could do this in a decade? Obviously, there's a policy issue of do we want to do it? Almost all this information is being created in a digital format now. So like publishing it online seems a realistic thing to expect. At the federal level, 97% of federal documents right now are born digital. I suspect that we probably have a similarly high percentage at the state and local level. Um, I think you run more into issues of like, how is it findable? How is it organized? You know, it's the size of the municipality that you're dealing with. But I think, I mean, it should be, this is, this is where people expect it. And government has an obligation to meet people um, where they live. And uh, they should be doing this. I think that it's reasonable to expect them to do this. Um, but you would be the one who would know better than I would in terms of um, what sort of technical barriers or financial barriers that might, that might exist. And policy barriers. Policy barriers is the biggest problem. We've been speaking with Daniel Schumann of Demand Progress. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, Daniel. My pleasure, Carl. Anytime. Always happy to talk to you. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.